When things go wrong, and this time, it's not your fault. We're going to be seeing that from John chapter 9. Uh, where we left off in John 9, we were in Jerusalem. I mean, in John 8, we were in Jerusalem. Let me get this up to speed here. And uh, we, in, in John 7 was the Feast of Tabernacles. We finished the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember when Jesus uh, said, I am the light of the world, and he also uh, when the water was poured out, he said, I'm the living water. Remember that? That was John 7. We moved in, into John 8, which was the day after the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and Jesus uh, forgave the woman who was caught in adultery. And then he basically told the Pharisees, I am God. They didn't like it, so they tried to kill him. Remember that? They picked up stones to stone him to death. But the end of John chapter 8 says... But he passed by. He, he passed by the Pharisees when they wanted to stone him and kill him. So we're still in Jerusalem, and we're in John chapter 9 picking up. He had just passed by the Pharisees who wanted to kill him. John chapter 9, verse 1 says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. So he passes by the Pharisees who want to kill him. He's still walking. He's still in Jerusalem. There's a blind man. Jesus isn't stumbled or bothered by these guys who try to kill him. If I was having people trying to kill me, I'd be running home or running to the police department. He doesn't. He sees a blind man and he's moved with compassion. And so as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was born blind. And his disciples asked Jesus, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? In other words, whose fault was it? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and he made clay with the saliva and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. In other words, here's mud in your eye. How's that? And then he said to the blind man, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and he washed and he came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen, seen that he was blind, they said, is not this he who sat and begged? Isn't this the blind beggar? Verse 9, some said, this is him. Others said, he's like him. And he said, I am he. I mean, you imagine that it's not him, it's him. It kind of looks like him, but it's not really. I'm listening, I am. Therefore they said to him, how are your eyes open? He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed and I received sight. And he, and he said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. As I look at this whole conversation, it's, it's really quite humorous. <laughs> the three main points. You ready? And before we go through the rest of our time here this morning, I believe that God uh, has called all of us to not just save us, but to be His light working through us to this world through grace. You ready? Number one, when God says it wasn't your fault, nor anybody else's, uh, we like to blame, the disciples wanted to blame. Verse two, whose fault was it? Was it his fault? In other words, did he sin in his mother's womb, which is kind of a weird thought, isn't it? Uh, cultures back then thought like that, cultures today think like that. Or if it wasn't his fault, then it had to be his mom or dad's fault. And Jesus said, neither. This is all about the glory of God. Sometimes in life, uh, things go wrong, and people suffer. Hence was the case with this man. Some things are really even hard to think about, some of the suffering that people go through. Uh, many years ago, the very first time I went to visit, uh, 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 do a home visit, it was with a pastor uh, who was my senior, and I went along as he was training me. I'm doing like an internship. And he says, come to me with this house. So we went to this house. And on the outside, it looked like every other house on the street. There were small homes on the street, but nice homes. Uh, it was near the Loma Linda area in Southern California. And I don't remember exactly where, but we went to the house, knocked on the door. And I wasn't prepared for what I would see. I went inside. There was this wonderful young couple. 
and they had their son in the middle of their small living room, and he's, I can't remember what, how he was propped up, uh, but he's hooked up to machines. He was born with severe disabilities, and he was not going to change. And um, he couldn't talk. He could make noises, and he could smile. That was about all he could do. And I think he was about 12 years old. And it was a shock to me because I had never seen that before. On the outside, everything looked great. Uh, I had no idea what was going on in this family's life, what mom and dad must have gone through. Their son's going to be born, and here he is, their baby. And they were a wonderful people. They, we just went by to pray, and I was ministered to more than I did any ministering. The next visit I went on was shortly after that, and it was in Moreno Valley, California. And another, how everything looked normal on the outside. We go inside, and there's this young lady. She was 16 or 17. And she was on uh, a hospital bed right by the stairs going up to the second floor. She's on the bottom floor. And she was not in good shape. Um, as my pastor friend told me when we left, he goes, if you've ever seen pictures of Holocaust victims when they die, that's what she looked like. She did. She looked like a skeleton, a living skeleton. Uh, she had, uh, cancer had wrecked her body uh, in a very short time. Six months before that, she was at school, a real popular girl at school, cute, vibrant, everything. Um, six months later, uh, her body's ruined. We went to pray. Uh, there were a few friends of hers that were over there. Um, three days later, she went to heaven. Charles Spurgeon said, whenever you see a man in sorrow and trouble, the way to look at it is not to blame and to inquire how they got there, but to say to self, Here's an opening for God's almighty love. Here's an occasion for the display of grace and goodness of the Lord. But the disciples didn't do that. They said, this guy's messed up. Whose fault is it? Well, we can do that same thing pretty easy, can't we? Uh, we can see somebody that's just, their life's messed up. And it tends to be even, excuse me, I don't know what that was. It was going to come out right there. So <laughs> you should all thank me. Ugh. But we tend to see situations where somebody's in the dire straits. And even as Christians, we can often, of, instead of pray for them, start to reason, oh, this is why they're like that. This is why they're like that. Uh, we see a homeless situation. Well, that's just... Da, 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 da. We would do well to, if we're not going to reach out, at least instead of have our minds go towards the negative, towards that situation, at least pray for them. God, help me to pray for these people. Maybe we do that, make that decision today. That's what I'm going to do from now on. So we tend to, we, we tend to blame God. We pl tend to blame other people. Well, um, that's what the disciples did. And we forget about God's grace. We forget about his mercy. This author writes, My friends John and Tricia experienced a parent's worst nightmare when their three-year-old son accidentally fell out of a second-story playroom window. Eli was medevaced to the hospital where he's comatose for three weeks. He miraculously covered, but not without significant brain damage. He had to relearn every basic motor function from speech to mobility, and despite the prayers of his parents and endless hours of physical therapy, Eli still has significant limitations. He has limited peripheral vision out of both of his eyes, so the left side of his body has limited motor skills. Uh, so Eli speaks with a severe stutter, and he walks with a pronounced limp, but he has the voice of an angel and the sweet spirit to match. His pitch isn't perfect, but there wasn't a dry eye when he sang, I will rise. Uh, you know that song by Chris Tomlin, I will rise? Uh, if I sang that right now, there wouldn't be a dry eye, but for an entirely different reason. Uh, John and Tricia 
have thanked God countless times for saving their son, but their, parent, their prayers for miraculous healing have gone unanswered. They've done everything humanly possible to help their son and spent tens of thousands of dollars on uninsured medical equipment. For the first three years post-surgery, they spent 80% of every waking hour in therapy. And they continued to believe that God was going to heal their son. In John's words, we waited and waited. We knew that one day we'd be standing in, the front, in front of crowds saying, look what the Lord has done. He has completely healed our son. But that's not what happened. What do you do when the miracle you're believing God for doesn't happen? When no matter how hard you pray or how long you wait, your day never comes. Sometimes you need to keep praying, but sometimes you need to accept the new normal and recognize that God might want to glorify himself in a way that you wouldn't choose. After three years of doing everything we could for our son, says the dad, John, it was time to accept his current condition and choose to live life with disability. This disability was something we couldn't remove, and evidently God was choosing to not completely heal Eli. So we had to burn our old scripts and look for what God do, would do with our new script. So for the past five years, we've accepted life with disability. That doesn't mean I've stopped praying for my son. Like any father, I'd give my right arm to see my son healed. But instead of getting discouraged or getting angry, I've chosen to look for what God will do with this. Uh, back in our story, the disciples said to Jesus, Rabbi, whose fault is it? Jesus said, it's nobody's fault. But that the works of God would be revealed in him. Uh, it's so easy to look, and, and, and we know there are decisions, life decisions that a person can make that will mess up things. Um, a young lady may get pregnant, and she's on heroin, and she doesn't quit, and she gives birth to a baby who's a heroin addict. Uh, we, we, we get that. Those things happen. But still, what cause does it give us to blame? What good did it do the disciples, even if that's how it happened, but it didn't happen that way? But what good would it do to point a finger and not care and not show compassion and not love? Whatever the reason, what the disciples assumed, they assumed, and they were wrong. They assumed it was somebody's fault. And even if it was, what do you do now? Let me give you a first takeaway here. Uh, five takeaways if I make it far enough today. Uh, the first takeaway is this, related to what we've just covered. Uh, we can talk about others or we can care about others, but we need to choose which one we're going to do. So the disciples regarded this man as an unsolved riddle. They showed no interest in helping him, but in discussing the cause for his condition. Okay, Lord, here's the blind man. What's the problem? I wonder if he heard them. Charles Spurgeon also said, uh, Jesus isn't dwelling on, theolo on the theological puzzle, but he's actually uh, dwelling on helping the man. Here's the theological puzzle. Why God this? Why have that? Blah, blah, blah. What did they do wrong? Then Spurgeon went on to say, it is ours not to speculate, but to perform acts of mercy and love according to the tenor of the gospel. Let us then be less inquisitive and more practical, less for cracking doctrinal nuts, and more for bringing forth the bread of life to the starving multitudes. All right, let's relate this to you and I. This, consider this a home message for us who are out here in the Hemet San Jacinto Valley. I can drive down the street, and I have eyes to see the same things you guys see. Um, and I'm not a cop. And I can see the problems. Uh, I see the valley. I, I, I see beauty, and I see s disaster. Um, I see some of the most beautiful landscaping. And I see some of the most messed up lives. Uh, broken lives uh, uh, you, I, I, and there's so many things you can blame um, but, but, but let's bring this to this place we can talk about others or we can care about others choose which will it be uh, so let's start bringing this 
home, right? So this is Wesley Franklin. Some of you recognize Wesley. Um, I, I saw Wesley the other day. I'm driving down Florida Avenue. It's pretty early in the morning. And Wesley was picking up trash, cleaning up the valley. It's, it's re- Here's what's the easier thing to do. You know what it is? It's easier to drive down the street and go, look at all that trash. Wesley picks it up. Wesley's a great brother in Christ. And he shares Jesus everywhere he goes. Wesley does what Wesley can do. Uh, this is a, uh, an ancient picture. Well, not ancient. It's an old picture. It's the Hemet Theater downtown. Uh, I had to get online to find that picture. And uh, one of uh, Chris Matson, who's one of our worship leaders, last week he put together a uh, a worship concert at that theater. It was one man. Not it wasn't a church. It wasn't a four twelve church thing. And I look at that and I think, okay, one man doing that. Uh, one man, who just okay. Here's what I can do. I can bring Jesus to the downtown area. I can use the gift I have to organize that. Uh, I, I, can, I can bring Jesus. I can walk around with my cross and tell people about Jesus, and I can pick up trash. That's what Wesley can do, and that's what Wesley does. Um, I, I look at these things. And here's a challenge. Um, I'm going to ask you now, as we continue through the next few minutes together, ask God to search you. You're one person. There's a good-sized church, a well-attended church that has the potential to make the difference for good, even for great, in this valley and in the lives of people. Or we can say, whose fault is that? And number three, One, when God says it wasn't your fault nor anybody else's. Number two, when God says he has a plan and it's not the same as your plan. Jesus answered, he says, uh, well, it has nothing to do with who sinned. It's not why this man was born blind, but for the works of God that they would be revealed in him, that God would be glorified I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day, for the night is coming when no one can work. Think of the times when this person is now a man, when he was a little boy, he went up and he tugged on his mom's apron strings and he said, Mommy, why am I blind? Think of the heartache that a mom and dad would have had. The other kids get to go out and play. Um, The other families are saying it's our fault. Uh, Our kids messed up, and it's us. And the guilt mom and dad would have had. And the pain they would have had looking at their son in this place. But Jesus, here he explained, it's because God wants to work in and through even this tragedy. Jesus pointed the question away from why and onto the idea of what can God do in this. Speaking to the situation, Jesus said, this is what God wants to do. He wants to be glorified in the situation. Second takeaway. Number one, we can talk about others or we can care about others, choose which it will be. Number two, second takeaway, the circumstances we ask God to change are often the very circumstances God is using to change us. We change Jobs, we change schools, we change 
neighborhoods, we change places. Um, uh, for various reasons. Sometimes it's even because of our children. I know with my children, sometimes I feel like changing some things. Uh, and then I go through a message like this in my own time, because i got to go through this stuff way before you guys do. And God's doing something. Even in my kids, in the situation, in the valley. Uh, back to the story of the little boy Eli who fell out of the window. At some point, we must recognize the circumstances we ask God to change are often the circumstances he's using to change us. In the story, like any normal father, John dreamed of playing catch in the backyard with his son. That's, that's something Eli isn't able to do. Eli will never make it to the big leagues, but he was drafted by the Miracle League, uh, truly, truly a, a real thing. A baseball league for kids with special needs, the Miracle League. At first, John was afraid that he was setting up his son to fail, but there's only one rule in the Miracle League. Every kid gets a hit, every kid gets on base, every kid scores. They play on a rubberized field for wheelchair accessibility, and each kid has a teenage or adult buddy. If you saw them play, says Dad, you'd call it a miracle. Sometimes the miracle we want isn't the one we get. God gives us a different one. About a year ago, the Miracle League did a black tie fundraiser hosted by the local minor league baseball team. A few major leaguers, including pitching sensation Javier Lopez, showed up. But it was Eli who stole the show by leading the crowd in a rousing rendition of Take Me Out to the Ball Game. There wasn't a dry eye in the, in the ballroom just like before. Eli has that effect. By the end of the night, Eli helped them raise lots of money so other kids like him could play ball too. He even signed a few autographs. There are lots of chapters yet to be written in Eli's life, but John can now see the storyline God is authoring in and through his son. He says, we've seen a lot of miracles that I don't have time to share but there's one thing I can tell you for sure. Those miracles would never have happened if life had gone according to my old script. I love that line. Those miracles never would have happened if life had gone according to my script. We have a script we write. God gives us something different. In Romans 8.28 the Bible says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. It, the Bible does not say all things are good and fun and exciting and full of peace and full of joy. I will work all things, the good, the bad, and the ugly, for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. What's His purpose? For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. F.F. F. Bruce writes in regards to the man being born blind, this does not mean that God deliberately caused the child to be born blind in order that after many years his glory should be displayed in the removal of blindness. To think so would be an aspersion on the character of God but it does mean that God overruled the disaster of the child's blindness so that when the child grew to manhood, he might, by the recovering of his sight, see the glory of God in the face of Christ and others seeing the work of God might turn to the true light of the world. God works all things for good that we would be pressed and conformed into the image of Christ and that others would see Christ in you and in your family and others would come to know Christ and see the light of the world. A second takeaway, the circumstances we ask God to change are often the very ones God is using to change us. Third takeaway, we don't have forever to do good toward others. Jesus said, I must 
work the works of him who sent me, verse 4, while it's day, for the night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Uh, his ministry, his earthly ministry is going to come to an end. He would die, go into the grave, resurrect, send his Holy Spirit, and his Holy Spirit would now work through his people. That they would see the light of the world and the grace and the goodness of the Lord through us. Let, let me give you a, a, a few other things. Um, Those look so good. Do they not? See that at the very top in the middle? Homeboy. Right? Homeboy Bakeries. Does that look good? Yeah? Do you like baked goods? Does that look good? Does that look good? Does that look good? Does that look good? Oh, yeah, those look good. Look at that. Delicious. Mmm, mmm, mmm. I was watching a Netflix program I like to watch. It's called, uh, uh, there's a series of them. Somebody Feed Phil are the newer episodes. I'll have what Phil's having are the older episodes. And it's Phil Rosenthal, who is the creator of Everybody Loves Raymond. And he, in this program, he tours the world. And he goes to Paris, and he has food. And you just go, oh. then Venice, Italy, and all, all around the Buenos Aires. Mexico City I watched the other night. Uh, Los Angeles is where this one comes from. Uh, he's from Los Angeles. He's a funny guy, but he loves to do this. And he went to, at the end of his Los Angeles program, he went to this place. He visited Homeboy Foods. Uh, notice how it says here, give hope with new gift packages. Look, it says hope, love, kinship, vegan. They even have vegan food. Something for everybody. How this homeboy bakery started is really cool. And they give food all over the world. They ship it. They give to high-end places. They supply restaurants. It is really a remarkable thing. But it was, it was making a difference. It was looking at his area, this, this gentleman. Uh, Father Frank uh, Gregory Boyle is his name. And uh, Catholic priest, <gasps> aren't we Protestants? So I was intrigued, but he's taken, he had this vision to, instead of people just getting out of the jails, they, they um, have a job. And so he coupled homeboy bakery with home girl and in 1992 after the los angeles riots homeboys bakery opened in boyle heights the first of homeboys uh, social enterprises it started as a training ground for aspiring bakers supplying fresh breads pastries and specialty goods to the walk-up counter at home girl cafe la farmers markets and restaurants throughout los angeles it is a place where former enemies bake bread side by side Learning the art and science of preparing breads, pastries, cakes, and much more. As Father Greg says, we don't hire homies to bake bread. We bake bread to hire homies. And I find it, I, I look at this and I say, okay, th this is cool. These are real pictures. This is just a part of this crew. It's a huge crew now. Listen, please. We can make a difference. In, in Christ, we are the light of the world shining. It's him shining through us. He's the light of the world, but shining through us. And we can drive down the street and say, look at that trash. Or look at Wesley, who's out there doing something about it. Say, look at this area over here. I, I was talking with the uh, um, Chad Bianco. He's running for sheriff in Riverside County the other day. Had, Met him at Starbucks. Oh, Starbucks and Catholics. What is, oh my, you're so evil. <laughs> I know how some Christians think. <laughs> Can you tell? I've been around the block. I've been around the Christian block. Um, 
and he started expressing this desire for this valley, asked him some questions, and it was, it was this. It was this, this thought, and we got on the subject of this, and it was so nice to have someone like-minded uh, wanting to s- see a difference. And he, he said, it would be great to have churches reach out. This is a good-sized church. All of us have something we can do. Um, one more thing, then we're going to move on because I'm going to have to. Uh, here on Sundays, um, we have a children's ministry. Did you know that? <laughs> we do. Do you know that every Sunday to run the three morning services and the evening service, is we need a minimum of 300 volunteers. That's a lot. Uh, from the worship teams to ushers to greeters to people in the parking lot, 300 minimum. That's the minimum that we need. Um, our children's ministry it's an opportunity to reach in and say, let me make a difference that they would know the light of the world. Some of them come from broken homes. Some of them come from great homes. They all need Jesus. And we make it really easy for you. You don't even have to teach. Um, but I'm going to ask you, if God so moves would you consider saying, here am I, send me. I can do that. I'm here on Sundays. I can do that. I can help. When you leave here, uh, on the right, you'll see this. That's hard to see in this picture. There's a blue canopy. It says 412 kids. Um, go for it. You can make a difference. Fourth takeaway. If you remember that the goal of any circumstance is for God's glory, you can get through anything. You believe it? That's what's going on here. A few months ago, a friend of mine was diagnosed with cancer, writes this person. And we've been praying for spontaneous remission, uh, the medical term for a miracle. Uh, Unfortunately, further tests were trending in the wrong direction at his first follow-up visit. When my friend called me, it was tough to know uh, what to say. And the truth is, it's better to listen than to talk. But then I felt like I needed to remind him of simple uh, yet difficult truth. I'm going to keep praying for your healing, but healing isn't the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is God's glory. He writes, I love for God to glorify himself by healing my friend, but even if my friend isn't healed, that wasn't the ultimate goal. The goal isn't the miracle. The goal is the glory of God. And if you forget that, it's difficult to get through difficult circumstances. So let me offer you this reminder. The will of God is the glory of God. That's why cancer can't keep you from doing the will of God. Nothing can. You can glorify God under any and every circumstance. It's God's glory. I can get through this. I can press forward. If you're going through a difficult time, you might be going through divorce, loss of loved ones, financial struggles. Kids won't talk to you. You pray, and you say, God, you're doing something in this, in me, in my circumstance. I don't get it. This man born blind, his mom and dad didn't get it. Oh, We, in this world, there's some things we will not get over. You don't get over the death of a child. You don't get over that. But you will get through the valley of the shadow of death, wrote the psalmist. We will get to the other side. And in eternity, you will see them again. Then, it will make sense. Here, we trust, okay, God, your glory is your purpose. You'll get us through this difficult thing. Last main point is when God tells you to do something. So this is what God told the blind man to do. He said, I want you to go to the pool of Siloam, which means sent, verse 7. I want you to wash in the pool of Siloam. So that's what the blind man did. He came back seen, and nobody could believe it. Who are you? You sure you're the same guy? Yes, I'm the same guy. So he goes to the Pool of Siloam. The Pool of Siloam, this is, uh, would be about right here. Um, 
in Gihon Springs is where the Pool of Siloam would flow from. Underneath, this is the, known as the city of David, the temple would be up here. Is that making any sense yet? Maybe this will. Okay, here, this probably won't either. But anyways, Gihon Springs, there's a tunnel here known as Hezekiah's Tunnel. Here's the Pool of Siloam. When you go to Israel today, you get to, whoops, you get to walk through Hezekiah's Tunnel underneath the city of David. It is phenomenal. What happened was about 700, 750 B.C., when the, the Assyrians were threatening King Hezekiah to conquer them, uh, how, a, how, a, how they would lay siege to a city, the enemy, they would shut off the water supply. So Hezekiah thought, well, I'm not going to let him shut off the water supply. So he had his people, they dug a tunnel underneath the city from Gihon Springs down to there so they'd have water. It's a brilliant plan. You can walk through there. It's the craziest thing. I've done it many times. Um, this, is, this gives you a real good idea right here. Here is the city of David now. Gihon Springs is over here. The water comes here. You come down here. You, you can go to the Pool of Siloam today remarkable so the blind man is up here somewhere with jesus he's blind he has to walk down here to the pool of siloam i look at that and i think how mean is jesus he could have just said you're healed you're blind i feel bad for you isn't that crazy he didn't and he put mud in his eye i mean they're walking around like oh i mean he did it anyways he was obedient to the Lord, and because he is obedient, it was, I've, I've ran, I got lost here one time, I got separated from the group, I got lost in this area down here. I had to run up to a bus up here, it is a miserable run. And at that time, I was actually in good shape. I'm always in a shape, but at that time, I was in a good shape, now I'm in a different shape. But uh, <laughs> this blind man, hundreds of steps he would have had to go, he did it anyways, he trusted Jesus. Last and final takeaway, um, we don't experience the world as it is, we experience the world as we are. <sighs> I read this story about this guy, he was, a train, he was a greeter at a train station, small community, years ago when trains would bring people. And as the story goes, a, a uh, gentleman got off the train, and he's there to greet him. Welcome to our city. What brings you here? He said, oh, the place I'm leaving was horrible. The people were this, and the place was like this, and the place was like da, 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 da. I can't wait to get a new start. The train greeter met him, and he said, oh, I encourage you to get back on that train, because you're going to find that the place you're coming to is just like the place you left. Next day, a man gets off the train. What brings you to our city, our valley? Oh, the place I'm leaving was beautiful. The people were wonderful. And oh, I, I hate to leave that place, but there's some changes that came, and uh, I need to move here. Oh, welcome to our place. You're going to find out that the place you've arrived is just like the place you left. <laughs> we don't experience the world as it is. We experience the world as we are close with this there was an experiment involving a group of uh, americans who had never been to mexico and a group of mexicans who had never been to america it proves the point uh, the researchers built a binocular viewing machine capable of showing one image to the right eye and one image to the left eye one of these snapshots was a baseball game the traditional american pastime the other was a bullfight traditional mexican pastime during the experiment, the pictures appeared simultaneously, forcing subjects to focus on one or the other. When asked what they had seen, the American subjects reported seeing a baseball game, while their Mexican counterparts reported only seeing a bullfight. How we perceive the world around us largely depends upon what we've experienced or not experienced, what we know or what we don't know, what we expect or don't expect. That is why Americans see a baseball game, Mexicans see a bullfight. That's also why the Pharisees would miss this miracle, which we'll find out next week. The miracle that happened right before their eyes. Bitter or better depends upon your perception. Experience is not what happens to you. 
It's what you do with what happens to you. Simple. Jesus is our hope. It's a challenge. We have Wesley picking up trash. We have music downtown. We have homeboy and homegirl foods. Every single child of God has the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. By the way, uh, the water from the Pool of Siloam, boy, I've got to wrap this up. The water in the Pool of Siloam was believed to be symbolic of the Holy Spirit ministering on the, on the, uh, um, during the Feast of Tabernacles when it was poured out. Still believed to be that way by Jews today during the Feast of Tabernacles. That's why Jesus said, I, uh, I'm the living water. We have the Holy Spirit. And we have, a, we have a decision. So my challenge is, what can I do? One person, with whatever I got, what can I do? And I want to encourage you, stop by the children's ministry table. You can make a difference right here on Sundays. Lord, we-